This one guy tells me, my boss asked me to sign this check. They said, no big deal. I didn't think anything of it. I trusted my boss and it ended up getting him in trouble. He didn't go to prison, but he's now a convicted felon as a result of this insurance controversy he got wrapped into. He can't plead ignorance? Like he just didn't no. know he was signing? No, that is not a defense of, I was just listening to my boss. That's not a defense. And so now, although he didn't do any jail time, he's a convicted felon. So he cannot drive for Uber. He cannot become a barber. Like there's so many things he can't do. So my point is that once you establish trust with someone, especially a superior, and they ask you to do something, it's tough to push back and say, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not signing my name on that. It's hard to do that. And that is this accidental perpetrator category. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Yeah, I got rejected by Bernie Madoff back in the day. But like I said to Jay, he's the real reject, not you. <laughs> or he was. Yeah, that's true. I mean, very bad things happened to him. But, you know, at the time, everybody says afterwards that, oh, we always knew he was a fraud. But I remember as I was going, literally going up the steps of the building to meet him, uh, every hedge fund manager was calling me and saying, hey, how can how can we get in his fund? Or uh -huh. figure out, try to figure out what he does. We're all trying to figure it out. And later they all denied calling me, which why would I remember them calling me if they didn't call me? <laughs> right, so, like I mean, you made like that up. specific people, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but your book was fascinating. And I mean, oh, I actually- I actually felt so bad for some of the people, both who were the victims and the people who were committing the frauds. Like in some cases, they didn't really know. Like it's true. It's true, James. It's true, right? Like, like who who did you feel most sorry for? Uh, it, what that you, of the fraudsters? Of that the went to jail. Yeah, that's okay. So of the fraudsters, so it depends on what category we're talking about, okay? So like of the intentional perpetrators, I'll tell you one, of the accidental perpetrators, all of them, and for the righteous perpetrators, I'll tell you the one. So for the intentional perpetrators, that category, the person I feel most sorry for is my um, former colleague that I used to teach with. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that he just got caught up and um, his name was Bob Lattice, or his name is Bob Lattice. And um, I probably feel that sorry is because I know him and I know his heart and I know his intentions and I know that um, he's done a lot of good, but you know, he made some mistakes. Now the accidental perpetrator category, I feel sorry for all of them because I think so many people can identify with them. Your boss asked you to do something. You didn't ask any questions. You just did it, right? You're like, I'm a people well, let's pleaser. Talk, let's talk about what, one of those. Like d describe the story uh, of the guy, I think his, his name was Andrew Johnson. Yes, Andrew. Um, was like sort of had a CFO type of role for a firm. Sure. Maybe tell that story because I have some questions sure. about that one. Okay, so Andrew, I interviewed him. He came to meet me. Nice guy. Just nice guy. Typical CPA. So sort of quiet, um, like a Boy Scout. You know, like you just somebody that you would let your dog spend the night with. You know, like he's not going to beat your dog. I'd let my and, dog spend the night with anybody. I don't care about my dog that much. But, <laughs> but um, you know how I'm people just, feel about their dogs. Like a lot yeah. of people are like really... Like, no, your dog, my dog can't go over there. So anyhow, he was um, had a finance role and was in an organization, a growth mindset organization, which a lot of organizations are. You know, we got to meet these numbers, sell, sell, sell. That's what we do. And oftentimes in those types of environments, no one wants to hear from the accountants. You know, no one wants to hear, oh, we got to book this entry correctly and we can't book this. Nobody wants to hear from them. All they want to hear are the results. And so Andrew was reporting to people that had marketing and sales as their background. And I'm not saying anything against those people, but sometimes they just don't want to hear the, the backstory of all the accounting or all the generally accepted accounting principles that we have to follow. So... Uh, one of the things that was happening is Andrew was tasked with making the numbers work. 
and he noticed that the way he worked in energy. And so there was a, a part, a portion of guesstimation that you had to do. And this is okay in accounting because sometimes you don't know the exact numbers when you're making an entry. So you do an estimate. So he estimated a certain amount and realized that he overestimated and it, they actually were experiencing losses. And he didn't want to report those losses. And the CEOs and the COOs didn't want him to report those losses. So what he did was something that we're familiar with now called earnings management. Now, you, if you have a loss in a period, you've got to show the loss in that period. You can't spread the loss through multiple periods to make it look a little bit better. That's not allowed under generally accepted accounting principles. Well, let me that's ask you a question. But oh, okay, finish finish the story and then I have some questions about it. Okay, so that's really what Andrew did. And he felt bad about it, but he was really just trying to be this team player. So and he spread this $2 million loss out over 12 months. So it was basically like whatever that the math is, $180,000 yeah. a month, something like that. And um, the auditors, um, their external auditors found out about it, figured it out. And all roads led back to Andrew with the FBI showing up at his door. And he was like, oh, my God. Okay, so can... the FBI showed up at his door and he's like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? What do I do? What have, what have I done wrong? I didn't do anything criminal. You know, I spread these this this loss throughout several periods. But do I go to jail for that? And so actually he did. So I feel bad for those kinds of stories and those types of um, professionals that end up in that situation because so many of us have sat in a room where there are decisions that you can either go left or you can go right and right could lead you to jail. And but, you know, will we get caught? Maybe, maybe not. And so I feel for people that end up in those situations because I think that is happening in every corporate boardroom across the country. Yeah, like his defense was, or what he said was, look, this is what the CEO wanted. He didn't want to lose his job. Uh, it was during a rough time. He was paying a mortgage. He had three kids, whatever it was. And he ends up in jail. And so I'm going to play devil's advocate on both sides because I described this actual story to a friend of mine after I read your book. And my friend said, okay, that's fraud. He knew what he was doing. He was an accountant. He knew what he was doing. Did he kind of know what he was doing? I mean, taking a $2 million loss and spreading it out over 12 months. So here's the thing. Yes, he he understood what he was doing. He understood that um, this probably isn't the right thing to do, but can I go to jail for it is another question. So, you know, a lot of us are faced with those situations. Could you, can you speed? Yes. But can you go so fast that you could go to jail for speeding, depending on where you're speeding, you know, so you don't think about how bad it could actually get. And so I, so yes, he, he okay, knew. Okay, I have another question. Like, um, okay, sorry, go ahead. He knew. It, it, he knew what he was, he knew, he understood the accounting rules, but no one is thinking that I'm going to end up in prison. You know, I see. why? So so it's like a speeding thing. Like he knew what he was doing was wrong, but he figured, okay, he'll get a slap on the wrist if it's ever discovered. If it's ever discovered. And what's the likelihood of it being discovered? And so when times are good, I'll, maybe we're not going to look and scrutinize in the same manner that we will when times are bad. And so well, that's true. Like I find a lot more frauds are uncovered when the tide is coming in on the economy as opposed to when everything is flourishing. Um, but let me ask you a question like, A, that quote, crime that he did, the, so, so it's a $2 million loss. You lost $2 million and you got to report your losses in the period where the losses happen. You can't sort of spread it out. But I'm thinking back to AOL 1994, Steve Case, they, they um, expensed out, you know, they sent AOL disks to 100 million people. Here's got, this has got a AOL on it. And even though they spent it that quarter, they spread out the expense over years as a marketing expense and they spread it out. And it was known that they did this, but like you said, good, it was an economic good times. No, you know, I think they got a slap on the wrist. No one went to jail. And that was like a huge, huge expense that they could have taken the loss like that quarter. And they just didn't. like, just like with, um, WorldCom, uh, yeah, WorldCom, WorldCom, same similar. thing. Same thing. 
And that guy went to jail for like life. Like Bernie Ebers is still in jail, I think. Yeah, he went to jail for a very long time. And you just, you know, Steve you can't Case is do- a billionaire, multi-billionaire. And I'm not mm-hmm. criticizing him. Like they, it's the same thing. Like, oh, they could just, like there's, there's a gray area in accounting. And so if this guy had said, okay, this $2 million loss was actually an expense that is a one-time expense that's, you know, going to spread out over years. And then before another expense like that happens, which was Steve Case's argument, then he might have had a defense. I don't know. Well, you think about, I think accounting is interesting because it's fundamentally set up for fraud because this one word gap, generally accepted accounting principles, generally accepted. So there's some wiggle room here just in the naming alone. They're not laws. It's generally accepted. So just in your mindset, if I said something is generally accepted to you, then you're going to be like, huh. Well, maybe, maybe I can do this and I won't get caught, but maybe I will. Let me, let me just sort of risk it. So I think that one of the fascinating in things for me was there's so much subjectivity in the decisions that accountants and finance professionals are able to make. And um, like I said earlier, you can go left or you can go right and right can land you to jail. And then I'll write a book about you. (laughs) Exactly. I think people are probably really afraid of that part after your documentaries as well. Let's, let's talk about one of those. The, and it's the first story you mentioned in the book, uh, Rita, forget her last name now. Grundwell. Yeah. And that, I feel like there's a spectrum. There's Andrew on the one side where I feel bad for the guy. He was in jail. He was following orders, which is a horrible, you know, excuse reminds me of the Holocaust, but it's, you know, cause that was the, ex- the defense Absolutely. of Adolf Eichmann. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, I could see it's a gray area there. Like you say, it's genuinely accepted. There was probably was an argument to be made. He also didn't know this was like a three year jail type of thing, but, um, the other end of the spectrum, you have the Bernie Madoffs, but those are the famous ones. Then you have this one that you did the documentary on, who was the, she was like the comptroller of, of Dixon, Illinois. And uh, t- please tell her story. Sure. So Rita Cronwell was the city comptroller of Dixon, Illinois. Let me give you some context. Dixon, small town, USA, 16,000 people located um, in the western part of the state of Illinois. And um, everybody trusted her. And for 20 years, she embezzled over $53.7 million. Now, this is not somebody that was on Wall Street that had a top 10 MBA who had some sophisticated algorithm to steal money. She just moved money from one account to the next and embezzled $53.7 million. And so um, everyone was- What was the budget? What was the town budget of Dixon, Ah. Illinois? Downtown budget was between six and eight million dollars. So she stole all the money all the time. How could she, how could the other, like the mayor, like how could he create a budget? And uh, I mean, she stole like nine years uh, worth of budget of, of the entire well, budget. Like, like, did he not see the benches being made, the, the sewers being fixed? Like, this is the thing. This is the thing, James. People leave accountants and financial professionals alone. No one wants to talk about money, ever. And so if I asked you, James, how much money do you make? You're going to automatically get uncomfortable, you know, because we just don't talk money. And so when you find a good person that is great at, your, at, great at the books, they like a really good accountant, you let them be. You're thankful that they're on your team and you leave them alone. And so they but- have so much power and so much control. But how could, again, like the mayor <laughs> runs for re-election every few years, and obviously he must have been winning because he kept appointing, somebody kept appointing her over and over again to be the city comptroller, um, or maybe that was an elected position, I don't know. But uh, how, the mayor makes promises like, yes, we're going to rebuild the community swimming pool. Like, what would happen when the swimming pool wasn't rebuilt? Well, you know, Rita could come back and say, we don't have the funding for it. The state is late and in, 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 um, giving us our money, so we don't have it. So this will have to be pushed off to another year, maybe two years from now. And that's but that. But then two years follow, and doesn't he say, well, where's no. that state money? <laughs> no, he doesn't. He moves on. He forgot. You know, he's not looking into the books. You know, you, you're, we're looking at this hindsight, but let's, let's sort of be in the moment. In the moment, you're going to your CFO and saying, well, you told me I was going to have money next year. Explain to me why we don't have it. No one 
one's doing that. Like no one's talking to her that way. They don't feel as though they understand the finances like she does. So no one's going to present her with that type of like that type of conflict of just tell me why. No one's doing that ever. And, and she so, knew that. And so so here's the thing like on on and I'm, there's no defense for Hirsch. What she did is, again, it's the, this is the other side of this. This is on the Madoff side of the spectrum. Uh, but what I'm wondering is, why did she then spend the money so extravagantly? Like, and, and, then, and then the other question is, when is enough enough? Okay, let's say she steals <laughs> $6 million, $3 million, $2 million, okay, which is more than she could have hoped for in her lifetime to have in the bank being a city comptroller of, of a small town, you know, finance department why didn't she just say okay over 19 years i took two million <laughs> i'm just going to retire now and live in an apartment and travel the world maybe and be happy you know, it's almost i think you um you've raised a good question when's enough enough and i i think about my dog nigel and left unattended nigel will eat non-stop until he pops he's not going to stop and so let's relate Nigel to Rita, for example. There were no internal controls in Dixon. So Rita could take as much as she wanted, as long as she wanted. So why stop? Because eventually everyone gets caught if you just keep doing it. <laughs> but eventually in this case was a very long time, which defies the, the research on how long frauds like this actually happened. 20 years is a long time for a simple embezzlement like this. 20 years. Most frauds don't last that long. So, you know, I would imagine if I could be in Rita's shoes, I would imagine around year five, I probably said to myself, oh, goodness, I probably should stop. But then the other devil on my shoulder said, but why? No one's paying attention. You, what you, you say, what you say is what happens. So why stop? But you mentioned research that shows that, you know, dishonesty adds to this level of stress in your life that just gets greater and greater. I mean, at some point, like, did she have some kind of, you know, neuron turned off so that this dishonesty didn't like stress her out so much? And I'm, by yeah. the way, I'm, I'm now in a weird way defending her as a human being. Like, didn't, <laughs> didn't, like something happened to her that like she could say, oh, I can't take this stress. I mean, one person turned herself in because it was so much stress. Exactly. But James, let me tell you something. Something I do in my class, before I show my documentary to my students, my graduate students, I'll ask them this. If you walked into the classroom and you saw a bag of money sitting on the table in front of you, tell me what are the first thoughts you have. And they're pretty silent and I'm like, no, come on, let, we're just gonna have some fun. Just let me hear let me hear what you're thinking. First student will say, Well, how much money is in the bag? Next student, well, what time does the next class come in? Third student, how old am I? Fourth student, have I passed the CP exam? Are my parents alive? Are there cameras in the room? Um, am I married? You know, have I gotten promoted? What they're doing is they're rationalizing why it is okay to take this money, okay? Typically, uh, probably about the 10th response, a student will say, well, I would turn the money into somebody. And everyone just like pounces on that person. Like, why would you do that? Why would you turn the money in without taking any? My point when I do this exercise with my students is to show them this is what the town of Dixon looked like to Rita. Money just sitting and just sitting there open for the taking. And so without controls, many of us would just take, 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 take and can rationalize why it's OK to do it. So, no, I don't think Rita experienced stress because no one really stressed her. No one paid attention to what she was doing. So it made it but, easy. But, but like this is a case where, again, like you described, there's a spectrum of fraud. And this is a case where. Clearly, she knew she was stealing. Like if someone said to her, are you stealing or not? She would have said, yes, I am stealing. And if she was just saying facts. And then the other thing is, it's, it's obviously against the law. As opposed to, let's say, 
um, some of the other situations, like the story you told earlier, but there was other situations where, at least at first, initially, it's a little unclear. Or in the, you know, in the situation with Steve Case and AOL, it was the same type of fraud as WorldCom. One guy goes to jail, the other guy doesn't go to jail. And so then, or there's other case stories, like, and I know I keep asking you for stories, but they're, they're fascinating stories. So I want people to, to hear the, the details. You know, tell the story of the, the woman who just literally did not benefit at all and just give the money away that she stole. I, I forget exactly which story. Yeah, that was. you're talking about um, the Elizabeth. righteous perpetrator, um, Elizabeth yeah. Rogers. Yeah. yeah, you know, so some people do steal just to help others. And so when I was writing the book, I wanted people to empathize with this perpetrator category. So when we first started talking and you said, you know, I've, I've really sort of felt sorry for some of the perpetrators. That is exactly how I want you to feel. And you probably saw it, thought, goodness, like they did do wrong, but I feel bad for them. You did it even with, you were defending sort of Rita's actions. And so everybody doesn't steal for just greed. And so this righteous perpetrator category um, is where Elizabeth Rogers fits. And so she felt as though her boss was this kind of slum lord kind of person in the community that was not creating great livable conditions or work conditions for people. And so she said, huh, he's not paying attention. I can create fictitious jobs and job orders for people to employ them so they can at least have money in their pockets. And sort of the, the Robin, Hoods, Robin Hood syndrome. And so some people actually do that. Um, the fir my first cr crime story, you know, if you start asking people, have you ever been defrauded or if you ever had an experience um, in fraud, everyone has a fraud story from what I've just learned over the years. And there was a person that lived in my neighborhood that I lived behind me. And this gentleman was an executive at a bank and he defrauded their bank to help a friend to help a friend with his business. His business was sort of at a slump and he wanted to help his friend's business grow. So he manipulated the books and was able to give him a loan that he should not have gotten. And he was able to manipulate the books and make sure that loan didn't show up on the financial statements. Now- And when you, and when you say manipulated the books, there's, there's playing with the numbers and there's outright putting wrong numbers in. Absolutely. So what was he doing? So he was creating fictitious loans. So he, so his, the transactions actually were fraudulent transactions that did end up in the book. So sometimes you can, cre you can be outside of the financial system, which makes it really, really hard to find. So like if Rita was stealing just cash that never entered into like the financial cycle, it would be much harder to track. But Rita's embezzlement actually ended up in the financial statements because if you remember, let me give you some a little accounting here. Assets have to equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. So the whole thing has to balance all the time. So if you take money out, then you're gonna have this hole. So you have to create some type of transaction to make the equation balance. And so that's how sometimes when you are within the accounting cycle and you take money out, you have to create a fictitious transaction so that it balances. So it's almost better to take money before it ever hits your books. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, so um, like just, just to explain, like in Rita's case, she would take the money out of the system and there wouldn't be a new community swimming pool. So someone so she, should recognize that. Right. So, so what she would do is she would create a fictitious invoice that then generated a fictitious transaction. Someone, someone being those external auditors, someone being the finance commissioner, someone should have recognized that this fakeness was going on because there are a lot of eyes on the books. So, so like, that like would she say, okay, I'm fixing the sewer and she would create a fictitious company, Sewer Fixers Inc. And then she would pay them, but that was her own company. So, and no so sewage what, actually that thing. Yeah. So that's what Elizabeth Rogers are the righteous perpetrator. That's what she would do. So she would say, yes, I can create a fictitious company, create a fictitious invoice, and then take the money, take the real money out of the system to give to a real person. Cause so that's what Elizabeth Rogers was doing. And so, um, and she didn't benefit at all. There was, it, she just wanted to help her community. She received nothing. And when I- But, but, uh, but to your point was, 
she didn't think deep enough because there were victims, which is still the people who live in the slumlords apartment buildings. There was even less money to provide services that they might have needed. Right. But since he wasn't providing the services, since her owner, the boss, wasn't providing the services anyway, at least this was a way to give them some give them something. So she called herself writing a wrong. And so she was very proud of it. So I, when I went to Bermuda, I was there for a fraud conference. Um, I had been invited to speak. And I said, um, when I was doing the planning, I asked, it's like, is there a federal prison there? Because they asked me, what do you want to do? You want to do anything on the island? And I said, you know, I'd love to visit a, a, a federal prison. And they're like, really? And I'm saying, yeah. And they said, well, we have a men's prison and we have a female, a, a women's prison. Which would you like to go to? And I said, ah. Let's go to the female prison. And it was right at the height of like Orange is the New Black. So I was like, yeah, I'll go there. I want to see what that experience is like. So I spent the day there. And when I met um, Elizabeth, she was she was very proud of what she did. Like, And she had a family, husband, kids. And she was proud that she was able to help people in her community. And I was just like, well, dang. I, I don't know that I would do that, but you know, it's, it's this, it's a type of perpetrator that does exist. And so there was the birth of the righteous perpetrator category. Well, let me ask you a question. Like these are all stories of people who were caught and we've got the intentional perpetrators. We've got the righteous perpetrators. Uh, we've got the people who are sort of in the middle. Uh, I, 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 the accidental. the accidental perpetrators. Okay. Tell us an accidental perpetrator story. Okay, so that was Andrew no. Johnson. So he was our accidental perpetrator. Um, I'm trying. It wasn't to quite accidental though, because he knows that that was well, against the law. So yeah, but this he's just is the following thing. orders. Y yes, so yes, people please are following orders, um, and most of us that are working professionals, if we are any perpetrator category, it would be the accidental perpetrator category that we would fall victim to. If there's anyone, you know, because yeah. I'm going to assume that. Most of your listeners are not intentional perpetrators. They're not. If they were ever to be one, they would not be that. But if your person that you report to asks you to do something and you never have had to push back or say something controversial or tell your boss no or tell your CEO no, then you could more you could be an accidental perpetrator in the making and you don't really realize it. So um, that's that's the category that I want um, a lot of people to be aware of because to the point that you made, we know in the back, back, back of our mind what's right and wrong, but when we're trying to be a team player, be a people pleaser, my boss asked me to do it, so I just did it, that's not at the forefront of your mind. You know, but I just finished, um, before we spoke, I did an interview a couple days back of a gentleman that engaged in insurance fraud. So I'm working on this big study with um, the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud. And I'm going and I'm interviewing these people that um, committed insurance fraud. And this one guy tells me, you know, my boss asked me to sign this check. Um, they said, no big deal. I didn't think anything of it. I trusted my boss so much. I didn't think that he would ever put me in a situation that would get me in trouble. And I'm making a really long story short. It ended up getting him in trouble and he went to prison for, well, was, he didn't go to prison, but he's now a convicted felon as a result of this insurance controversy he got wrapped into. He was, he, he can't plead, he can't plead ignorance. Like he just didn't no, know. He was hiding. No, he can't plead. That is not a defense of, I was just listening to my boss. That's not a defense. And unfortunately, it's not. And so now, although he didn't do any jail time, he's a convicted felon. So he cannot drive for Uber. He cannot become a barber. Like there's so many things he can't do. And he was a You can't become a barber if you're a convicted no, felon? No, you know, no. Wow. You can't get That's a probably, license. It's probably half the barbers I've ever had were probably convicted felons. <laughs> no, like they weren't. If they were, they didn't have a license. <laughs> Oh but God. no, so so my my point is that once you establish trust with someone, especially a superior, and they ask you to do something, it's tough to push back and say, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. I'm not signing my name on that. It's hard to do that. And that is this accidental perpetrator category. So 
I've interviewed a fair amount of lawyers, CPAs, executives that fall into that category. And so we have to be careful for them. We have to watch you know, out also, for them. I, I also want to say another part of your, of, of your book, uh, and by the way, I'll do an intro in the beginning describing the book and all that kind of stuff. But one part of your book that was really scary is, and I think I've seen this like a billion times where the accountant says, if, if this is on the victim side now, the accountant says to you, hey, uh, I'm dealing with the IRS or whatever, write me the check, I'll send it to the IRS. You know, this is how I do it with all my clients, blah, blah, blah. And that's like just common business, like the, everybody does that. And sometimes the accountant just puts the money in their pocket. Okay. And that is scary because there's a lot of times you could be a victim and there's almost no way James, you would know not to be a victim. James, I have never written a check to my accountant that is meant to go to the IRS. Never. My accountant always instructs me, write the check to the Internal Revenue Service, not even IRS. Internal Revenue Service, I have never in my life been instructed by any CPA to write my tax debt to them and they'll pay it for me. That didn't even sound right, James. Think about what we're saying. That didn't even sound right. And it happens all of the time, but just think about it. Happens all the time. I remember, I remember reading a, a memoir, it's a really long time ago. Um, I read this by, you ever, you ever see the book, Jonathan Livingston Siegel? Like I've in the seventies or eighties, it sold like fifty million copies. It's kind of an inspirational book. But then in his memoir, he described how all the rev all the profits he made from that book, ha he lost because of this exact type of setup. So I've heard about this like a million yeah, times. But think, but James, think about this. My accountant, let's say my accountant has a hundred clients. Why would I write a check to my accountant for that person to then write? A, ch a bulk check to all to the IRS for who knows how much for all the account all of his clients. Does that make any sense to you? I honestly don't know. That's why I'm saying I James, can James, you see know it I doesn't make. No, that. it doesn't. You know, I mean, it's just like okay. Let me let me give you another example. Say, for instance, you and I go to lunch, and we're going to my favorite lunch spot, and you're paying. And I said, James, I'm going to just take the points for this so it'll go into my account. So I'll get a coupon the next time I go, right? Sure. I'm taking your points. I'm taking something from you, right? Yeah, but I'm being a nice person and saying, yeah, I'm never going to come back here. It was awful. N not as good as you said it was. So but, you can have the points. <laughs> but we do understand that there's a personal benefit for me while I'm asking that, right? Yeah. There has to be a personal benefit that you would think that your tax accountant is getting, whether that's I points see. on their credit card, whether that's taking your money. There is something that that person is getting that you are not. That should be your thinking when someone asks you, oh, don't pay them. Just pay me and I'll pay it for you. Uh -uh. You know, you know why that's hard to uh, uh, track is that people are afraid of the IRS. So they're like, you're going to handle this transaction with the IRS for me. No but problem. It's, Go for it's it. exactly that why you need to give it to the IRS. You're, you're exactly yeah. right. People are afraid and you should be. My grandmother, Grandma Kelly, always said, don't mess with the IRS. That's what she always said to me just growing up, you know, like just hearing, you know, old folks tell stories. That was one yeah. of her things that she would always say. And so, yeah, and that's the reason why when you do your taxes and it says you owe the IRS $5,000. Write the check to the IRS, never to, never to John Doe or Jane Doe. Don't write it to them because there's something and wrong there. You talk about the, the fraud triangle. Um, like what, what, are the, what are the three aspects of every fraud? So Donald Cressy established the fraud triangle years ago, and, and the three components are opportunity, pressure, and rationalization. And um, it's, a, it's a really nice, neat way to, to break down all frauds. What I wanted to do was really explore that rationalization category more, which is why I started interviewing white collar felons, whistleblowers, and victims of fraud. Like, did Rita ever rationalize what she did? The, oh, the, the Comptroller of Dixon? Like, did you ever, because you did a documentary, did she, I, I couldn't find if she had, because you never spoke with her specifically. You had that weird interaction with her brother where he wanted a, a full pardon and payment. But uh, 
did, do you think she ever rationalized? Because because Bernie Madoff rationalized. He said he made a lot of people. Ha everybody was grateful for him for 30 years until he was caught. So Rita's rationalization, I believe, was because I can. You know, like it. it sometimes the rationalization doesn't have to be as complex as. I have a sick child, or I have a shopping habit, or I have a gambling addiction, or um, I'm ill and I need to pay for medication. Like, sometimes it could just be because I can, because I want to, and because I can, and because I have access. And what's interesting is so many of us have access. And not to say we're going to do what she did, but a lot of us have access. And we can rationalize so many things. I mean... But then, then, like, there's an interesting situation, or an interesting type of fraud, which is a little bit more abstract, and and it became very direct. And you describe it the the huge, huge fraud perpetrated by the cigarette industry, where uh, this was a, in in the whistleblower section, or starts to be in the whistleblower section, where essentially there was a whistleblower who said, "Look, the cigarette companies are knowingly putting more nicotine than advertised in the cigarettes, and it's causing." Lung, they know it's causing lung cancer and, all, and addiction and all these other things. And there was a $360 billion settlement. But, okay, they could rationalize it by saying lots of people love this. They love the extra nicotine, They blah, blah, blah. But, okay, what about the soft drink industry, which is knowingly putting a lot of sugar in cans of soda? And they everybody know it's not a secret that sugar also causes cancer, you know, too much of it causes cancer and inflammation and all sorts of diseases. Like, why why don't we think they're criminals, but now because there's a sediment, we think the cigarette industry are criminals. Great question. And you know why we don't think they're, they're criminals is because they didn't break a law. So I think that the question is, no, they may not be criminals, but are they unethical? I think so. You know, it, it, it's an indirect problem that you're creating but they didn't break a law so is it a law is it is it illegal to put too much sugar in a in a in a drink no not yet you know is it illegal to put too much nicotine in a cigarette maybe now i think maybe now after that case but you know like yeah. there's there's there are these legal hurdles that we can always stay under i'll tell you something that happened to me the other day i, I went to um one of these med spots. I just wanted to check out this med spot because I kept getting these Instagram posts about, come check this med spa out. So I go into this med spa and I'm thinking, you know, they just do facials and stuff. But James, they had these IV drips. Like if you were a little tired, you can come and get an IV drip of for some energy. Or, or our nurse on, on site can make you just a concoction for this IV drip. And so I go in and I said, you all are located in a strip mall and you want me to put an IV in my arm to get some energy? Are you crazy? And they said, oh no, it's completely fine. What we've learned is if we stay in a certain bandwidth, there's a lot of services that we can offer that you don't need a doctor on site. And I said, you know what? You might not have broken any law, but there is no way that you located beside Office Depot is sticking an IV in my arm because you figured out how to stay under the radar and, and not need a doctor on site. My point is there are lots of things that we can do that may not be illegal, but they just feel wrong. Does that, does that feel wrong to you? An IV right yeah. next door to Office Depot? In your it does, arm? but I, I like how Office Depot becomes kind of uh, uh, a metaphor for the absolute gutter of <laughs> medical services. I didn't mean to say it. I didn't mean it like that, but I you mean, understand. It twice. Yeah. No, I, I get it. Yeah. But, you know, then I also wonder, like, take insider tra trading, which is against the law. And people have argued for the past century whether there's victims or not, but it's against the law. And now it's considered unethical you know it's the subject of the movie wall street and many other movies and uh but initially you know some of the most well-known you know industrialists and philanthropists from the early part of the 1900s they made a lot of their money from insider trading i mean when they made the law against insider trading franklin roosevelt put 
in the first commissioner of the Securities and Exchange Commission was Joseph Kennedy, who was probably the biggest, you know, John F. Kennedy's father, who was probably the biggest insider trader of those days. And Franklin Roosevelt specifically said, you got to put the criminal in charge to watch the other criminals. Like he it knows where all the cells are. Right. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, but like that was something that sort of became unethical because it became against the law. Absolutely. As, as it wasn't Absolutely. necessarily wrong or right. Like I think it's a gr uh, people argue to this day whether there's a victim to that because on the one hand, the more uh, you know, a marketplace is defined by how much information is in it, and the more information, the better. So insider trading provides information that wouldn't otherwise be in the market, and that's the argument of people who yeah who think it's illegal. I'm not saying it. Nobody should do it, by the way. I'm not arguing it's against the law. It is unethical to break the law, knowingly break the law. So nobody should do it. Um, but that's the argument for making it yeah. legal. And, you know, the point, I think, from that is the insider trading example is one of the few that is in direct alignment with ethics and law. And something that I do with my graduate students is I give them this five question ethics survey at the very beginning of class and they have to go around and five, ten, find 10 people that they have to interview. And there's an insider trading ethical case that they have to ask people, you know, is this wrong? Is it not? Out of the five situations that they have to talk to people about, insider trading is the only one they say, oh, that's wrong because it's illegal. Everything else sits in this area of gray, but insider trading is the one that everyone says, oh, no, 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 I'm not doing that because that's against the law. So there's this direct alignment between I'm not doing it only because it's against the law. Now, if there were no law established, would people do it? Probably even more. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Because they do it now with so many, <laughs> with so many people law. get caught every day. And yeah. so this leads to the other question, which is a lot of people get caught but I've been in like the hedge fund industry and there is so many, so much corruption. It is like unbelievable. Like you can't, you can't even, and on the one hand, there's a lot of gray area in the financial industry because when there's new financial innovation, the laws have to catch up to the ethics. Um, but there's just, I would just see so much like I, I, and I've talked about this case before on, on the, the podcast. There was one guy, he stole about $10 million from his hedge fund. And I knew the guy and I knew the hedge fund. And Wall Street, you know, the SEC said to him, listen, we're investigating you. We think you stole $10 million. And he said, okay, I could fight you, which will take a long time for you and me, or I could pay the fine right now, this second. And they said, it's a $50,000 fine. And he wired the money the day after they told him they were investigating him. Case closed. He disappeared. $10 million. Boom, they're on to the next case because it's not worth it to them to spend 10 million to recover 10 million and they got they got their money. They got the fine and he disappeared. So so and I've seen a lot of cases like that. So how much is so those are cases that are caught but not really known about. And then there's even further caught but not punished. Caught caught but not punished. But then there's even further. There's he he got caught. Many don't get caught. So like how many case like you you investigate the ones where okay it's in the news we know you know there's a whistleblower we know there's a, a case here one way or the other there's a case but how many cases don't even start where how many readers from dixon illinois are there out there that we're just never going to catch i would say trillions worth trillions worth because like, like are we are we only at the tip of the iceberg the corruption I think that we're, we know i think we're only at the tip of the iceberg um primarily because I don't think technology has caught up with catching everyone. And I think being a whistleblower is so um, demonized in our society that even if you knew, you're not going to tell. And so for those two things, so for those two reasons, I think we're just, I don't even know if we're close to the iceberg. I, I can't even say we're at the tip of it. Where What's what's further away than the tip? Uh, we're in a wave. We can see the yeah. iceberg way away from us. I would say like on Wall Street, we all know about Bernie Madoff, but I would say corruption is such a daily common occurrence that it's it, it dwarfs any Madoff or corruption that we that we know about. I don't know about the ones where, you know, some controller of a small town steals $50 million. That seems like so extreme. It's got to get caught. But maybe there's a lot out there where they stole two million, one million, and then they retired and never got caught. I do know of cases where 
the CEO of a company would find out the CFO was stealing money and for a lot of reasons, would just fire the person and never report it to the police because they wouldn't the want to scare their investors. Yeah, yeah the reputation for sure. of the company uh, and so on. So there's a lot of there's all these layers of corruption not caught sometimes for very ra- like very rationalized reasons that people didn't get turned in or wasn't pursued or, or whatever. And so it's scary out there. It's scary out there. But I'll tell you, if you're out there doing a fraud and you haven't gotten caught, please call me. Please, I won't tell your name. I just want to know your story. Like, I want to know how you have, how you've stayed under the radar for so long. But I think that well, there's. Have you ever, have you ever interviewed someone like that? So, I'll, yes. I'll try to find people for you. Like, but I, if I you, let me tell you, I, we, you can stay anonymous. I want to talk to you. I want to know, because that's a whole nother element of a, of a, a scheme that was never caught. So I've interviewed people that. This they were they they were arrested for a scheme, but they were doing other schemes that were not known. So they were caught ish. You know what I mean? Because they had other things going on that were not detected. So I've done those kind of interviews before, and um, they're a little they're a little scary just because you know some information that they that they could probably have more years added on to their sentence for, but you know you you don't say. But I've never talked to somebody who has executed a scheme and gotten away with it successfully and just sort of faded to black and went went to another country, another island, and they just started a new life. But if they exist, we would have a but good time I imagine, talking to them. I imagine that there are, like, think about corrupt countries, okay, where it's part of the culture that, you know, the government control gets, uh, you know, $100 million in aid from the U.S. and other countries and some percentage of that hundred million goes into the pockets of the, the sure. president and maybe the top 10 people in the government. And then what happens to all those people? Do they just end up in Ibiza or some island and they live out a life of luxury? Like there must be like millions of people like that. Just, you know, there have, there there. have to be because because we, we can't keep up with catching everybody. So they have to exist. They're out there. I just don't know how to find them. I don't know how to. I find think if them. you just go to one of those like luxury or go to Switzerland, they yeah, to yeah, the- and just spend a, spend a couple months there, and I'll probably just run into them, right? Yeah, but like, then um, what? Ha- what you say? happens? What will happen to me once I know the information? Maybe, maybe my life will be threatened. I don't know. Maybe it's too dangerous. I know that's a scary thing. Like if someone's a criminal, they're a criminal through and through in in many cases. So you know, <laughs> right. if they so- went so far as to do the crime and then escape and get away with it. They're going to keep getting away with it and not put that at risk. So don't call me. I take that back. Don't call. <laughs> right. Leave her out of it. So so what got you into this? I mean, I mean, it's a fascinating topic. I kind of wish I was a fraud investigator. Like it seems fun. <laughs> you know, a um, couple things. Uh, one, um, that story I talked about with my neighbor um, who seemed to have it all and risked it all to help a friend and went to prison and, and ruined his, his life was a really early story for me because I just was like, so adults behave badly? Like I was in high school when that happened. But really, um, I remember when I was early in my teaching days, this whole idea that this is those people that do this, you know, it's them that does crime and corruption and engages in financial statement fraud. And I really wanted people to understand, no, it's us. This is a us thing. We all have the propensity to fudge a number, to use a corporate car for personal expenses, or to say personal expenses are work expenses and we use them as a tax deduction on our on our returns. All of us, all of us. Have- like, let me ask you a question. Have you mm-hmm. never gone to a dinner and then you said, look, Let's speak for a minute or two about business. No. It'll be a tax write-off. No, absolutely not, James. You're asking me. No, 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 no. I would say, I would say there's another hundred million people or more <laughs> who do that. So this is the thing. So you're so the question you're asking though is would I do that because I think the probability of detection is low? And so that a hundred million people that you think would do that feel like, yeah, what's the likelihood I'm ever going to get caught? Is there going to be some video footage? You're of not me? doing something wrong if you actually talk business. Okay. So we meet. It's so funny you say that. How, how, That's, many minutes, how many minutes do you have to talk business at a dinner before you could say this was a business expense? Do you realize this is one of the cases I debate about all the time with executives? And there are. I'm, I'm fascinated. 
Yeah, 50% think it's okay, 50% say it's not. A lot of people say, if we have an hour-long lunch, we talk for five minutes, that's called networking. I didn't intend for it to be such a short piece of time we were going to talk about business. It just ended up that way. Some people say that they would prorate that lunch and say, you know, of the five, min five minutes okay. of that hour is just work. So I'm just going to prorate that amount and call that, that a business expense. That seems fair. But also the networking aspect could be like, okay, you're, you're meeting with someone for lunch during the workday. So it's, it's, it's during a, a regular workday. You're meeting for someone and it could be networking. You don't know them that well. They're in a related business and maybe you don't talk business at all, but the lunch is networking. I, there got, it's got to be a great there's area. A lot, there. There's a lot of gray area. There's a lot of gray area. Yeah. You know, they're, they're for sure. So, so my, so my point of how I got into this is being fascinated by the gray, being fascinated how really ethical, intelligent people can really rationalize. Eh, well, maybe I could sort of fudge this, you know, so that, that those things together just got me um, into the area of wanting to understand how fraud happens, how you can stop it. And um, as you may know, I'm an accounting professor by training and I wanted to make my class just more fun. And I think fraud and talking about X, X ethics or is what, is the foundation of accounting. So we talk a lot about fraud stories, um, ethical decision-making, and I just think it just makes accounting just so much more relevant. So I'm curious, from the perspective of an accounting professor, would you say all of Wall Street is a fraud? Because <laughs> all of Wall Street on their quarterly numbers, they report their gap numbers. And like you say, generally accepted has a wide range. But when they report on their tax returns, they report wildly different numbers in almost every case. I don't know any case that's the, the, their gap numbers, which is official accounting roles, is the same as their IRS statements. Maybe Warren Buffett, because I do think, well, even there, it's it's, it's tricky. But um, uh, uh, like it's all of Wall Street a fraud because of the disparity between gap and IRS reported numbers. Sure, and I don't want all Wall Street hating me, so I probably shouldn't answer that question. <laughs> But um, there's a lot of subjectivity to um, accounting. And yes, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of difference between book and um, taxes and your, your financial gap that you're reporting. You're exactly right. Um, so that's all I'm going to say. Why, why can't that, why can't it be, you know, why can't you just say uh, accounting is, you know, the, the only way to do it is on a cash in cash out basis. And if something looks weird, like let's say you have a huge loss, you just explain it. Like for instance, let's say Google buys a company for a billion dollars. Okay, the way it works now is they can spread out the expense of that company over 20 years. Like we're gonna make use of the, the this company. for So it's not a billion dollar loss. It's not a billion dollar expense that day. We're gonna spread it out over 20 years. So it's 50 million a year. And that's gap. That's generally accepted accounting principles. But why can't they just say, yeah, we spent a billion dollars um, you, you, the investor can judge the correctness or incorrectness of this. And here's our actual profits from selling our product. By the way, we have losses because we also spent a billion dollars buying this company. Like, why can't it just be simple like that? I think it could be simple that way if we truly operated on a cash basis society. Because of something called credit, we can't do that. But I think what you're saying, if we, you know, if you, if you make $10, and you spend $5, why can't we just have these transactions simple and clean? But credit is really what tr what makes things harder because you can recognize your revenue when earned, not necessarily when cash is received. And that is the the mm. the, the, the the rub. You can recognize expenses when um, incurred, not when they're paid. So this, this delay of timing is what we're trying to capture in accounting. And that, I think, is what creates the um the hiccup if you will because um it doesn't become clean we we do not live in a, a cash basis society so what you're saying is just like a mom and pop shop you know you made a hundred dollars at the end of the month that's what you have in your cash register that's what you went and put in the bank and you spent 50 so you have 50 left it's easy to see that but that's not really how we operate our businesses so we need a system that matches how we actually live but like that system 
is what creates an entire category of fraud. That, that leads system the, is that what creates the World Toms and the Enrons and and all all of the above. Like probably every Wall Street company is a, a closet WorldCom. Accrual basis accounting is what creates a category of fraud. You're absolutely right. That's exactly right. And that's yeah. why we need ethical accountants, ethical auditors, ethical executives, ethical C-suite people. That is why we need them all because of this category of fraud that's created based on the way we, we work. Well, let me know when you find one because I'd like to interview that person. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that exists. I mean, everybody's, you know, everybody's gaming what they can and rationalizing it. I, I would say almost everything is a fraud except for podcasting, of course. Of course. I, I, I would say almost everything is because of issues with branding and disclosure, issues with you know different styles of accounting, issues with the laws not catching up with the ethics. Like, you know, why did nobody at Lehman Brothers ever go to jail? They clearly were doing things that were unethical, but there weren't any laws for derivatives on top of derivatives on top of okay. derivatives of a housing price. So- that they got away with it and you know who know who even knows what they did then then they had to, they had to fix the economic system that they broke so they got paid even more to go back and fix <laughs> things fix yeah. and nobody went to jail nobody went so, to jail so uh but i would say we only touched upon a few of the stories in your book fool me once and the subtitle scams stories and secrets from the trillion dollar fraud industry and uh, the f stories are fascinating. I like how you just, you go, you dive right into the stories. It drew me right in. And I'm just fascinated by, by these stories and, and your investigation of it. Like, were you ever in, uh, you mentioned in the book, a time where you almost got defrauded by uh, a, a phone uh, <laughs> tax fraud scheme. The IRS they, actually. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and, and that happens a lot. That's, that's happened to me. I get, I get those, emails or mails like almost every day i'm sure everyone does now because it's like that's a whole industry but were you like were your parents ever defraud like did you ever see fraud really up close and personal you know um so my parents were never defrauded but my father um was a college president and he had an employee that uh, was accused of embezzlement and so, um, from the college, yeah, from the college. And so he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't steal any money, but he had an employee that did. Um, and that was really the, the, the closest thing that, um, personally affected me at an early age because he really wanted to let an investigation go through the process to figure out what actually was happening. And so, um, he, but the the larger community wanted him guilty before the investigation started. So I saw how my dad really tried to reason through a fraudulent situation that he didn't have direct. Um, in, he didn't have direct. Um, he didn't steal money, but someone that reported to him did. And so he ended up um, really taking the fall for this person because he believed in the, the due process. And that wasn't what, what other people taking the fall. Well, he decided, you know, I'm not going to um, I'm not going to fire this individual until we have an investigation and it's proven that he actually stole the money. And so um, the people didn't agree with his choice. So he decided to resign. So he um, that's when I say when I say taking the fall, you know, he wanted he believed in letting the process work itself out to figure out if he was actually um, guilty because you know you're innocent until proven guilty supposedly but a lot of us feel like you're guilty until you're guilty and you're guilty yeah. until you're proven guilty which is not how we actually should operate so he uh, that was the closest um situation that did he find a um, job after that like what did he do after that yeah so he was a professor so my father was a professor so i sort of followed in his footsteps so he went back um into the classroom so he was a, an administrator for a while but just went back to teaching so i'm a second generation yeah. college professor that's great. And like, did he, did any, did he encounter any re resistance when he wanted to be a professor again? Did people associate him with the fraud? No. Um, Was so, he scared of that? No, they, he didn't face any resistance, but one of the things that he did face was when he decided that, huh, maybe I, I would like to be an administrator again. Um, it wasn't, he wasn't um, welcomed back into that 
community of becoming a college president again. So I did see that because of his decision to say, you know, we need to let this process run its course. And so I did see that he was he was um, when he decided to become a college president in his contract, he worked out at any given time he could go back into the classroom. So that was already part of his contract anyhow. So he wouldn't he didn't receive any resistance or um, no one ghosted him or anything like that. So that was All right, good. good. Well, Kelly Pope, uh, author of Fool Me Once, thank you once again for coming on the podcast. Fascinating stories. Uh, I'd love to have you on again, particularly when the inevitable huge fraud comes to light somewhere in the world. So I'd uh, love to come back. And you know, we should we, we could do we should have one of the um, people from the stories come and we should talk to them. Yeah, yeah, um, that would be good because yeah. uh, the psychology of it. And, and the, the gap between reality and rationalization sometimes is so large, it's unbelievable. Sometimes you can understand the rationalization, like in the very simple example of the work, is it a work lunch or not? But other times the rationalization is just pure fiction, but the, but the criminal believes it. Yeah, and, I'll give you, know, you one. Mm -hmm. There's one story, just thinking about what you just said, there's one story in the book and it's about Dr. Robert Courtney. And he was a uh, he was a compound pharmacist, and what he did um, he was supposed to develop uh, uh, chemotherapy drugs for patients, and what he started to do was dilute those drugs such that he could stretch it out and increase his margins. And so he ended up doing this. So think about you may have a stage four um, breast cancer patient who is going into the doctor to get their chemotherapy. And they're really just getting saline solution. And so what Dr. Courtney said to himself, his rationalization was, well, this person's going to die anyway. Who's going to detect it? When they do die, no one's going to suspect anything anyway. And so um, he ended up uh, manipulating about over 40,000 prescriptions and thousands of people were impacted. But you think about the evilness and we talked about how yeah. things are on this spectrum but that's very disturbing because how would you know when you go to the pharmacist and you get your medicine how do you even tell if it's been manipulated or not you just take it put it in your mouth and assume that it's fine you don't even have a way to check it so f fraud is everywhere and it's de it definitely lives on a spectrum but we are impacted yeah, how, did, how did he how did, oh he rationalized oh. it mm. yeah let me tell you how he got caught. So let me finish the story. So the way he got caught was there was a nurse that worked in the um, doctor's office of the, on the oncologist. And what she started to get very suspicious of was the stage four cancer patients didn't have the traditional um, hair loss or nausea or weight loss. They, they didn't have those signs. Now, granted, all patients could have could respond differently, but there are some indicators that most or some key markers that most cancer patients have. So she was started to get really concerned. And so she mm -hmm. took a sample of what she thought was the chemotherapy drugs and sent it to the FDA. And when they ran tests on it, they realized that it had very little medication in it. And that's how it was exposed. So it was a nurse who just was suspicious. Like, why aren't my patients showing the traditional signs of um, cancer patients? And that's how he, that's how he was exposed. By the and way, there's so many fascinating things about that. Like, first off, why didn't the doctor who prescribed the medication notice this? Why was it the nurse who noticed this? Not I... that the nurse is lower ranking than a doctor. I'm not saying that. But the doctor really is in charge of the health of the patient, ultimately. Why didn't the, any doctor notice this out of 40,000 well, prescriptions? Yeah, and, and that's a, that is a really good point. And that doctor has since retired because of this, the emotional um, responsibility that she took or lack thereof. And so she couldn't deal with it. So she retired early. And the other thing there is, is that... Um, there, it's very interesting that there was no placebo effect from the drugs. So, so these drugs work and a placebo is not strong enough that, as chemotherapy. Well, the patients were in, a lot of them were in extreme pain. And so um, 
it's a it's an interesting case. Um, Robert Courtney. So look that up. There's been yeah. um, it, it'll make you angry, though. So just get prepared It's because when you start talking about health issues, it's 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 yeah. um, it's it's painful. But Robert Courtney, you'll find him fascinating. Funny thing is or not really funny thing is he tried to seek um, compassionate release under the covid um, compassion release due to covid. So he tried. He almost got out of prison early. So um, when people heard that he was going to get out, they were outraged. And so he still sits in prison today. But he almost came home, just like Rita. That is crazy. That is crazy. So, well, anyway, Kelly, thanks once again. And I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll see you again on the show. And the book is Fool Me Once, Scam Stories and Secrets from the Trillion Dollar Fraud Industry. And there's a lot of great stories in here. You're a great storyteller. People should check out your documentaries as well. What are the names of your documentaries? Documentaries, All the Queen's Horses. You will love it. All the Queen's Horses. And you got into film festivals and everything. Yeah, we got, yeah, this accountant professor got got that movie around. Who would have thought, right? So yeah, it's gotten um, film festivals. It lives on Amazon Prime, so you can check it out there. Did you get an Oscar? Did you go for no. an Oscar? Oh, gosh, I wish. You know, I should have. You know, I next think time. I, next time, right? Next time. Maybe when you talk to the people who haven't been caught yet, that, you'll get an Oscar for that one. But then, but then I probably they'll probably kill me. So I, you know, it'll or, be or, after I die. Or you're an accomplice and you'll go to jail. <laughs> right. Because once you know, you have to. You're an I accomplice. have to. I have to whistleblow, right? <laughs> yeah. But all right. Well, thanks so much, Kelly, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having me. This was so much fun.